recently I had this revelation. Um, I had COVID a few weeks back and I was laying sick in bed and I I don't know what you're like, but when I'm sick and I've been in bed all day in the nighttime, I can't sleep. And it was about between 12 to 3 a.m. and I'm laying in bed and I was just listening to something and it was like something just went like just illuminated in me and it just started making me burn. I heard this scripture and it's a scripture I've heard all the time. I don't know if you've heard it. It's in John, but it says that the Holy Spirit will come and he will convict you of uh, convict of sin, of judgment and of righteousness. And so as he started unraveling the scripture to me, more revelation came and I'm actually lying in bed and I'm thinking, what the heck? Like it didn't even feel legal to believe the revelation I was believing and I started laughing I was like filled with this joy and and this burning and I know what God feels like when you know when his presence is near me but yet my mind couldn't understand it or grasp it because everything I've believed since I was little or everything I've been taught or everything a a teacher or a pastor or someone who through different places in my life they've told me something that's what I believed And, you know, there were probably some people who told me the truth, yet I wasn't able to receive it because I believed what the old thing was. And so today I want to share this revelation that I had. And I almost (laughs) wasn't going to preach it because it sort of felt like, is this, is this right? You know, and, but the thing is, as I studied it over the last few weeks and I've studied it and studied it and studied it and all that has been shown to me like God has just confirmed it and he's like been washing me with it he's been renewing my mind and he's been showing me this is actually what I want to show you you know this is actually what my word says so some of you might have this revelation some of you might not but for me I didn't know it and the very sentence is the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you of sin which is could be controversial to some but let me just explain it to you (laughs) so in John 16 it's a time where the disciples were sitting with Jesus in the upper room from John 13 to John uh, 17 I think it's known as the farewell discourse it was a time where Jesus we know it as the last supper Jesus is sitting with the disciples and he's having this time with him. It's this time of, you know, intimacy. He's telling them that I'm about to go. I'm about to leave. He's telling them that you're going to be persecuted. There's going to be trials. There's going to be all these things coming against you. He's telling about, you know, the love and how to love others. And he's talking about the, all these kingdom realities and these truths, these things that will happen once he's not here. But in one moment, he says to them, He says to him that I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be buried, I'm going to be raised up again and I'm going to be seated with the Father. And at this point, these disciples are just thinking, what the heck, you know, this man who is our teacher, who's our friend, he's, he's been this reformer on the earth, he's been, you know, the liberator, he's, he's moved in signs and wonders and miracles, but he also knew them, like he knew their hearts, he, he heard their stories, he showed them how to love that person who everybody called, you know, unworthy. He showed them all these beautiful kingdom truths. And so all they can think about is you know this guy is leaving like I I can't grasp it and the scripture continues to say Jesus says I have to leave but when I go I'm leaving you with something better I'm leaving something better and these guys are thinking you know okay he's going how can there be something better imagine if your best friend leaves you're like you know your parent you're like oh I'm dying but there's going to be something better like you can't in your soul grasp that reality but Jesus says I am and you know the Bible says that these guys were so full of sorrow. They were so upset. Their, their hearts were just possessed with sorrow. But Jesus, who we know him as, after the, cross, after the cross, we know him as a truth. We know him as the liberator. We know him as salvation. He ends up coming, like he ends up saying to them in that moment, I am telling you the truth. And he says, my leaving will be better for you than me being here it will actually be a gift that will serve you well. 
Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit, he cannot come. The counsellor, the advocate, the intercessor, the standby. Like if I don't leave, if I don't die, then this spirit, he cannot come. But when I go, I will send him to you and he will be in close fellowship with you. And so what we know now, they didn't know then or maybe they weren't wanting to listen at that moment because they were too upset. But Jesus needed to leave so the spirit could come. And so as we know, he offered up himself, his body, Jesus as man, the perfect sinless sacrifice. He gave himself up. He was crucified. He died. But because of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he was raised back to life. He was made alive by the Spirit and he was declared, like in all of the heavens, he was declared the Son of God because of the resurrection. And he was seated with the Father in heavenly places. So Jesus was no longer a man. He was no longer a flesh in flesh. He was no longer this person that was next to them and walking and moving and doing life and fellowshipping with them. But now Jesus came and he left his spirit. And that spirit is the Holy Spirit who came to fill them. The spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit living in them. And the word says we know that the... We are the temple of God, the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And so it is the Spirit, we know the Holy Spirit. It is him who witnesses and testifies to us that we are children of God. So that word, it means he confirms it. When he witnesses and testifies, it, like his, the Holy Spirit is confirming to us that we are children of God. He is validating it. He is verifying it. He reminds us. He convinces us that you are a child of God. He assures us. It's his Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells you over and over and over and over and over that you are God's child. And that you're nothing else but his children. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sorry, I get excited. It's like, ah. So if you're feeling like a sinner, if you're feeling like an orphan, like if you feel like this, this new nature, this, this divine identity, this reality is too good to be true, like I was thinking in my bed, it, it, this can't be true. I, my soul, my flesh, even, you know, the lies, I had to prove it wrong. But the thing is, the voice of God isn't telling you that. The voice of God is telling you that you are a son. And so I'm not saying that there aren't thoughts and things and moments and hardships and things that are happening in life, but I'm framing the very foundation of what it is that God is telling us who we are. So who we can look to and what perspective and what lens we can look through when things come against us. God says throughout all of his word that you are born again into his family he calls you his children. He calls you his very own. He calls you his treasure, his prized possession. He calls you just holy and flawless in his eyes. That before he made the world that he chose you, <laughs> he loved you. And going back to that, you're holy and you're flawless in his sight. Like you're holy and you're flawless in the eyes of the supreme sovereign God, the Father. Romans 5.1 says that because of what our Lord Jesus did for us on the cross, that by faith, so when we hear this faith, faith means to believe, it's adhering to, it's holding on to, it's clinging on to. So by faith, I believe what Jesus did on the cross. So now I have peace with God. That we have been made right in the sight of God by faith. I might not feel like I'm right, but by faith, I'm believing that everything he did on the cross, I'm holding, I'm clinging on to it. Even when I don't feel like it, I have been made right in the sight of God. And so when God sees us, doesn't matter how we think or how we feel, like that matters to him. And, you know, but I mean, like when God's, you know what I mean? When God sees us, he does not see anything else except for his son. He sees the beauty of his son, the holiness of the son. And even when he looks at you, he says, 
He will never say, this is the best bit. <laughs> you are in the wrong. He won't say that. You know, when you have a car accident, I've been in one and it wasn't my fault, but I got declared, you are in the wrong. And I was so frustrated. But the thing is, when God is looking at us, he's not saying, even if it was your fault, he's not looking at you and saying, you are in the wrong. He's saying, you are in the right, no matter what your actions, your thoughts, your behavior, or anything you do because of the blood of Jesus, you are in the right. It's a bit hard to take sometimes. (laughs) Another translation says that we have been acquitted and declared not guilty. So because we've been declared not guilty, we are now able to experience true and lasting peace with God. So when you break up that word peace in that in that scripture, it says wholeness, completeness, harmony of mind, body and spirit. Because you've been made right with God that we can have a wholeness in our life, a wholeness and just harmony, you know. And it is only through Jesus, the anointed one, the liberating king. And I just felt in that moment to go into, okay, what's a liber- you know, liberating king? One translation says liberating king. You know, Jesus is the freedom. He brought us freedom. But it says that Jesus has set us free from every restraint that has been on our lives, from every confined box. You know, sometimes we feel like we've just been pushed into a box. He came to break that box open he's came he came to break off every limitation in your life every accusation every form of bondage and and um you know every chain even for ourselves and our souls like every expectation and every disappointment he the liberating king has come to break off every tormenting or accusing voice or condemning voice in your life every enemy So when the enemy condemns you and he reminds you of your past, of your mistakes or of your shortcomings, don't fall for his tactics because all he is doing is trying to sow seeds of doubt within you, into your soul and into your heart. He's looking for that one point of alignment, whether it's big or whether it's little. How can I get them to believe in what I'm saying, which in turn means unbelief in God, unbelief in the character of God, unbelief in the nature of God. Someone could say, oh, I had this dream and God did this. We could go, no, he didn't. That's unbelief. Romans 8, 1 says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that means past, present, future. You all in this room, if you have Jesus Christ as your saviour, saviour, you're all not guilty. Which means that the enemy can bring your case to God. Like he can have this big file. He can bring this case to God. He can put it on the judge stand and he can go, I've got proof. I've got notes. I've got pictures. I've got video. I've got audio. I've got every bit of proof to prove them in the wrong. And God will grab that case and he's like, okay, let me have a look at it. And when he sees it, he can only see the blood of Jesus that has drenched it, that has covered it. And he looks at it and even the enemy's like, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong wrong and is accusing and is judging and God's like they're not in the wrong not guilty I convict you free I convict you righteous hallelujah (laughs) so the verdict is clear and final you are judged not guilty whether you believe it or not that is the truth so after having all these glorious truths (laughs) reading that I wanted to paint the picture to help you see this revelation that God gave me well he it was already there he just opened my eyes so John 16 says and when he comes he will one convict us of sin two convict of righteousness three convict of judgment number one he'll convict concerning sin because they don't believe in me when I read this, when I used to read it, I'd be like, oh, the Holy Spirit's convicting me of, oh, I did that thing and he's convicting me of like, oh, what do you think you're doing? You know, like just, just feeling heavy and weighed down and I wouldn't 
be receiving the Holy Spirit and what he's saying in the right light because of, you know, it could be because of my past, because of, you know, voices in my life before. But as I started studying this, when it says that he will convict the world concerning sin because they don't believe in me. And so then this was like, Phew, hang on, he's not convicting me of sin. He's convicting the unbelievers of sin. And the word convict means to come in and to shine a light on and to expose the darkness. So the Holy Spirit goes into the dark places, in this case, of the unbelievers' lives. And he says to them, like he's showing them and he's revealing them their, to them their sin nature. And the main purpose, not to judge, not to condemn, but his main purpose is to bring them back into right relationship with God, to bring them back into the loving fall over that thing in a second (laughs) bringing them back to him and so when I studied this word as well you know the he will convict of sin it's not actually saying sins and so your sins are you know your gluttony your anger your lust your you know everything just whatever your sin is that's sins but sin in this scripture is an actual noun and it means your sin nature so the holy spirit is convicting unbelievers of their sin nature he's not like some christians will go out into the world and we will go and evangelize and we're trying to convict people of all the things they're doing wrong but god's like i'm not even looking at that i'm looking at their sin nature and how does he convict them with that he shows them who they are he shows them what righteousness is Sorry, I'm losing my breath. I'm talking too quick. So John 3.17 says, For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on, but he came to the world so the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound with them so even when he's convicting the unbelievers he's convicting them in love his heart is to reconcile them back to the father he's just showing them that and encouraging them that if you have faith in my son that if you believe in him that you will not perish but you will have eternal life come into right standing with the father come so you can be righteous so you can be safe and you can be sound in him so number two this was the 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 great revelation that i felt for me was he's not convicting me of sin so what's he convicting me of i'm a believer he's convicting me of righteousness So when the father looks at us as believers, he sees righteousness. He sees his son because we are hidden in him. So that's our new nature and that's our identity. So we're not being convicted of sin like the unbelievers because our nature isn't sinner anymore. Our nature is son. Their nature, because of unbelief, means that they are sinners. But our nature, because we are believers, means that we are sons. And it's impossible, absolutely impossible to be a sinner and to be a son at the same time. Just as it's impossible to have faith and unbelief coexist. So the second we believe in him, we are saved. We're not being convicted of sin. We're no longer a sinner. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness, he's coming to do that exactly. To be convicted of righteousness is to have your identity in Christ affirmed. He's not pointing out your flaws. And this is where I would sometimes think the wrong thinking in my mind because, you know, you grow up, you get in trouble. And, you know, as a pastor's kids, I got in trouble a lot. And it was like I would feel that you're being convicted of unrighteousness. But he's not. He's not, recall, he's not reminding you of what you did wrong. He's not judging you. Rather, he's assuring you. He's reminding you. He's taken away every bit of doubt that your sins have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That you are God's beloved child. His role, no matter what, is to remind you 
of your new nature. You are no longer a slave to sin, but a child of God. No longer living under the law, but living free in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always point us to the Son, not to sin. So when we are sin focused, and this, I think, you know, part of my issue sometimes is when I'm sin focused, when I'm looking at sin, that's all I can see. That's all I'm focused on. I can only see the sin around me. I can only see the judgment. I can only see condemnation. You know, I might have a bad attitude. I might be confused. I might have doubt. I might be full of unbelief. But when we look at the sun and when we focus on him and all these things that I've said, then we start to align and agree with what these words are saying. Like we start to see ourselves in the same lens that he sees us so when you do feel condemned you know these are questions these are things I had to like try and understand then why do I feel like this sometimes and you know daily we need to really ask whose voice are we listening to we need to remind ourselves you know if it brings guilt and condemnation if it discourages and if it produces fear if it leads us into busyness and endless loops endless loops of overthinking and anxiety and worry or if it pushes us to try and you know make ourselves better or to prove ourselves or leads us even into running and hiding and into compromise and into you know doing things that don't align with this word then we have to recognize like those voices whether it's your friend whether it's your mind whether it's an enemy whatever the voice is that's not the voice of God his voice speaks love his voice reminds you of who you are. He corrects you. He shows you the way to go. He shows you the path of righteousness. He leads you. He guides you. He encourages you. He exhorts you. He lifts you up. He reassures you. He brings us into wholeness and soundness of mind and stillness of soul. He calms us. He brings us into rest. He speaks in truth and he tells us the way to go, but he's clear and he confirms. God's goal always is to lead us into closer relationship with him. So any voice that is leading us away, turning away, moving away from him in relationship, we need to question, is this even God? And it's something I teach my kids, you know, I I like to tell the kids, you know, we're trying to teach them these incredible biblical truths but it's like how do they understand it as little kids and so when you see you know one of them's like I won't say anything uh, they're they're being mean to their sibling and they're calling them names or you know they're being harsh or they're being unkind or they're being you know full of fear I just say to them I remind them number one just like the Holy Spirit does to us I want to convict them of righteousness I'm not sitting there going oh what did you do to your brother get in your room I can't believe you said that disgusting word no I'm saying hey what are you doing that's not who you are like do you remember when last time you know when you had this much fear remember how brave you were do you remember that time when you felt so sad and, you know, you prayed and Jesus came and he filled your heart like with, with peace? Like right now you get to decide what kingdom are you serving? And my kids understand this. They're eating of the tree of fruit of, of the fruit of uh, the spirit or they're eating from the tree of the fruit of sin. So they can say, oh, I'm in fear now. Lord, I want to come to you and I want to get eat the peace so they can identify it. And in that same way, you know, God does that to us. When he convicts us, he's giving us options. He's reminding us. He's showing us the word. He's leading us in the right way. He's not punishing us. He's not doing anything like that. And it's like the woman <laughs> caught in adultery. You know, we see it in the word. She was literally caught in the act of adultery. And all the religious people of the time, they like rip her out. They come and they throw it in that public square or wherever it was, threw it in the dirt and she's there and she's shamed. She's condemned, she's broken, she's hurting, she's exposed. And they said to Jesus, I can't remember what they said, but Jesus ended up just in peace. Like it's one of the most beautiful stories. And he said to these religious people who are judging and attacking, he said, he who is without sin cast the first stone, which is basically saying, 
if you're a good and you've got nothing wrong with you, then you can judge her. But if you've got something wrong with you, you better get out of here. And so slowly they kept leaving and leaving. And could you imagine this woman would have been sitting there, what the heck, like just in absolute shock, experiencing the mercy and the love and the compassion and the beauty of Jesus. But then he said to her, you shouldn't have been in that room doing that stuff. No, he didn't say that. He said to her, go and sin no more. He was reaffirming her identity to her. He wasn't looking at the sin. He was saying, this is who you are. Like, this is where you need to go. Stop looking at every failure and mistake. Walk in the light of the sun. And unfortunately, many of us as believers were taught to be so hypersensitive to sin. You know, as God's been breaking religion off me too, I have people say to me, oh, that's so religious. You're just so hypersensitive to this particular subject. And sometimes we are. Like we can only see what the wrong things that people are doing. And, you know, maybe we had someone in our life who didn't understand what freedom really looked like. Maybe we were, maybe we were brought up in it. Maybe, you know, all we've ever experienced is people pointing us to sin instead of pointing us to the sun. Instead of lifting us up out of the pit, they're pushing us in there. And sometimes even us, we can be our own worst enemy. Sometimes the only voice we hear is condemnation. And this voice can come from our own soul, our mind, our will, our emotion. It can come from you know, people around us. But also it can come from the enemy. The word of God says, be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy of yours, the devil, he roams around like a fierce, hungry lion. He is looking to devour you. He is hoping, he's waiting. He's just like, oh, just begging to wait for you to fall so he can come and take you out. He is the father of lies. Like he wants to attack you. He wants to hurt you and he'll do anything it takes to bring you down. And he does it subtly. Like when you read in the word about the vineyards and the sly little foxes, they came in bit by bit by bit, and they started gnawing at the roots of the vine. They didn't burn the vine and take it out. They come in bit by bit by bit. And one translation or one study speaks about, you know, they even came and peed on it. And it was just bit by bit by bit. And then eventually, yeah, yeah. So eventually the whole vineyard was taken out. It was destroyed. You know, when don't need to think that the whole uh, that the whole that the devil's going to come in like an atom bomb and just obliterate everything but like he can come week after week month after month year after year under the radar and planting seeds of doubt why his number one reason why the root of it all is to destroy your faith in god your faith in him providing guiding, looking after you so he can produce unbelief. Sin is unbelief. The word says, for God so loved the world, we all know this, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So like I said before, believing means holding on to him. It's trusting him. It's depending him on him. It's it's. It's relying on him. So we all know we have eternal life, yeah? If you're a saint, you have eternal life. But the question I want to ask today, are we trusting him and are we relying on him and are we depending on on him in all things? You know, the enemy has power over us if we believe and... uh, No power, sorry, that's... The enemy has no power over us if we believe and hold firm and trust God. If we trust his word, the enemy has no power over us. But if we start losing our faith in God, even the little things, like we might stop reading the word, we might stop surrounding ourselves with believers, like from people who are going to speak life, then the enemy will start to gain access to your life. When people say, read the word, pastors, ministers say, guys, you need to be in the word, you need to pray. They're not telling you that in a religious way they're telling you to protect you because this keeps you safe it keeps you safe
sound. It keeps you in belief. It keeps you in faith in God. And the enemy has no power over your life. But the enemy, like I said with the foxes, he doesn't care how long it takes. He doesn't care about anything, if it's big or if it's small. He's looking for one point to come and align with you in unbelief. And he is waiting and he is ready to take you out. And, you know, there's my, there might be times in our lives, like, you know, sometimes we hear this and we're holy and flawless. And it's like, yeah, but I don't feel like that. And I feel, you know, what's going on. But if you took whatever problem it is you have and you took it all the way down to the core, it, the root of it would be unbelief. And so we need to ask ourselves, not looking at the sin, why am I in this repetitive thing? Why am I thinking bad? Why is it hard for me to act in love? Instead of looking at the surface stuff, we need to go to the root and say, what am I not believing God for here right now? God wants us to trust him. He wants us to have faith in him and not one ounce of belief, unbelief. And that's why he sent his spirit to remind us to affirm who we are, to affirm this truth that he's not convicting us of sin, but is convicting us of our identity in him. He's convicting us of the belief, the areas we need to believe in him. He's convicting us how to trust him, reminding us, convincing us how we can surrender our trust and make him Lord over every area. When the Lord reminds us of Scripture, He does it so we can renew our mind in it. To hold on to the promises when the enemy comes, when the attacks come, when we start condemning ourselves, when these lies start coming, saying you're not good enough, they don't like you, you'll never get that job, you'll never get that relationship, your child will never come back to the kingdom. The Lord wants you to grab the word and hold on to the promises that He's given. And you say, no. This is what he's promised. This is his nature. This is who I am. I will not listen to any attacking or accusing voice. And he points the helper, the advocate, the guide, the spirit. He points out every area of unbelief in our lives so we can turn around, we can change our mind, and we can choose to align with God's heart and his nature as a son and full of faith. That's what repentance is. Being aware of the areas of unbelief that we have and choosing not to align with it anymore. I don't want to listen to that anymore. I want to turn away and I want to believe what God says. You know, confessing, I don't, I don't want this anymore, but I want you. So again, I know I'm saying this a few times and I'm nearly finished, but the moment... We move in unbelief. Not, we're not looking at sins. We're looking at sin, unbelief. The moment we move in unbelief that we are aligning with the enemy and we're allowing him to come into our lives and to take plant seeds of doubt, doubt into our thoughts. And if we sit for long enough in those doubts, if we don't renew our mind, if we don't share with trusted people in our life, if we we don't get wisdom and counsel, if we don't sit in the presence of God, then those lies will become trees and they will start sprouting the fruit of sin in our life. They will start taking over. They will start causing destruction. You know, when you see people who need deliverance, it all starts with unbelief. They didn't believe God for something didn't align with something and sometimes deliverance is just as easy as telling someone the truth reaffirming their identity and so yeah let's just close our eyes for a minute so I just want us to all think about for a minute you know what areas in our life are we not trusting God for? Maybe there's areas that still reflect the sinful nature that we're holding on to. Maybe there's areas in our lives that we just can't find freedom from. Maybe it's even a person who has hurt you. They might not be there anymore. It might be a a parent or someone in the past or someone religious. Maybe there's been this condemning voice in your life and the Lord is saying, I want you to let go. 
hear my voice. Let me affirm you. Will you forgive them? What aren't we believing God for? Where is it in our lives that we're allowing doubt to come in and to take the higher place? Who are we listening to? Are we listening to truth or to lies? Are we listening to the advocate or the accuser? Are we believing that we're a sinner or a son? Whatever it is, Father God, we thank you that you see us holy, that you see us flawless in your life. Jesus, we thank you for your blood that has drenched that big, thick, ugly case file of our lives, of our past, of our brokenness, of our failures. Doesn't exist anymore. You have been made right. You are no longer in the wrong. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to exalt you, Jesus, over every area of our life. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for affirming us, for reminding us, for showing us the way of righteousness, for showing us the beauty that is found in relationship with the Son, for leading us into your presence. Lord, I ask today that as everybody leaves, Lord, that you just continue to minister to them. Lord, that they see themselves rightly the way that you see them. We break off in the name of Jesus every lie of the enemy that's been whispering in their ears. We break off every voice of condemnation, God, even unhealthy relationships or friendships who are speaking the wrong words to them. And Lord, I ask that you just bring people into their lives who will reaffirm who they are in you, Lord. I ask that you bring people into their lives that look like you, Jesus, that points them to you. May you be glorified, Jesus. May you be exalted, above every lesser thing. May you be Lord of all. In Jesus' name.